So today we continue with the other cephalopod morphologies. Uh, previously we came to know about some of the morphological uh, descriptions of some of the parts of the cephalopoda and in continuation with the class we will learn some uh, other morphological descriptions of cephalopoda so firstly the ammonite jaws now as i already told you in the previous classes ammonite are the predators they chase their prey and thereby they hunt their prey so they have a well developed jaw system by which they can chew or feed the prey now it was previously thought that the aperture of by a single plate or a pair of calcitic plates which are known as aptychus and in plural number it is known as aptychi now later when the this kind of calcareous plates are directly found with the fossil of ammonites particularly with the um, body chamber of ammonites and research was done on their functions it was found that rather than a protection door aptychi is used for multifunctional aspect uh, most commonly it is used for feeding um, it is also used for protection by closing the apertural open and not only that it also used for propulsion that is for pumping for diving or stabilizing during the swimming within the water body so due to this multifunctional aspects of a single organ the diversity of aptychi that means the different uh, looks of aptychi uh, with respect to the different shell varieties of ammonite is very few that means there are lots of varieties of ammonites are found with respect to their external cell morphologies with respect to their external cell appearance but the variation in the shape size or uh, looks of aptychi is very limited because it is the evolutionary law by which uh, we know that when a organ is used for multiple functions it has some sort of uh, restrictions that is why it is bound by the different functions and they showed less uh, number of varieties so aptychi or aptychus is also an example of such type of organ where it is used for multiple function in ammonites and therefore it is uh, limited in diversity now here is the picture how uh, an aptychi placed for closing the aperture you can see this red portion uh, where the aptychus close the apertural opening here is a fossil record where the aptychus is found uh, disarticulated or found disoriented after the death of ammonite but it is found in association with the body chamber here you can see the single uh, aptychus so most commonly like the gastropod opercula when the gastropod uh, organism is suffer death most likely the operculum uh, becomes detached with the organism and suffer different different taphonomic effect so the gastropod cell and the operculum deposited separately likewise the aptychus or aptychi of ammonites also they uh, rarely preserve with its original uh, body shell or which is original hard part most likely they are detached after the death of the ammonite 
or after the uh, death of this particular individual and move apart from each other because of different taphonomic effect. Now some other measurable uh, parameters found within a cephalopod or uh, within an ammonite or nautilus, whatever you. So first thing is the umbilicus. It is part of the cephalopod shell. So this portion, uh, if you try to define or if you try to measure the umbilicus portion, actually it is the uh, cephalopod shell excluding the last hole that is this much portion the last resisted dd coiling at this much portion and this much portion if you exclude uh, from the cephalopod the rest of the portion is known as umbilicus and it indicates the earlier ontogeny of the cephalopod so during that time the growth of the cell was uh, far low compared to the last hole so this part becomes a uh, depressed portion now this depressed portion may be large or may be narrow depending on the hole overlapping that is how much the latter hole cover the previous hole now if we measure the diameter of this umbilicus portion that is the maximum length of umbilicus portion uh, although it is here shown as the yellow color but uh, it should be like this that is the maximum length of the umbilicus portion but that length must pass through the center so this portion that in this case it is the portion where we get the maximum length of umbilicus and this line passes through the central portion so this length is known as umbilical diameter similarly when we measure the diameter of the shell that is the maximum length of the uh, cephalopod shell that is the maximum length passing through the center of the shell so this portion this is the diameter so whether you measure the diameter or the umbilical diameter the line must pass to the center of the shell now one tricky thing is that if you measure the diameter that is the maximum length and from that diameter if you uh, subtract the last whole measure this portion this second bracket portion that you that will give you the umbilical diameter so keep in mind always umbilical diameter will be less than diameter in this case this will be the umbilical diameter sorry this will be the diameter that is the maximum length passing through the center and if we discard the last part that is last hole that is from here to here this much portion is my umbilical diameter so you can see always the umbilical diameter is less than the diameter now the bordering portion of umbilicus that is this portion here you can see the red line the bordering portion this is known as umbilical shoulder and often or it is found in some cephalopods that this umbilicus portion is covered by some extra calcareous material secreted by the cephalopod itself which is known as callus or it is often known as umbilical callus as it is covered the umbilicus portion uh, but keep in mind umbilical callus or simple callus is not observed for in all cephalopods it is only found in few cephalopods in most of the cases the umbilicus portion is open as you can see in these two pictures now for apertural view of a cephalopod showing all the holes all the previous holes uh, continuing up to the last hole yeah 
here you can see the umbilicus portion that is the centralized depressed part this funnel shaped portion that is the umbilical umbilicus and the callus that is the extra calcareous material is found cover this portion uh, where it is present uh, so the, the diameter of this portion that is the length of this portion is the umbilical diameter uh, here you can see this is the umbilical shoulder so umbilical is bounded by some kinds of vertical uh, walls of the last hole and this is the flank of each hole for this hole this is the flank or side or often we call it a lateral surface so for every hole for the next or for the previous hole this will be the flank so this vertical wall which is called as umbilical wall and the junction between flank lateral surface this angular portion this angular portion is known as umbilical shoulder here you can see also this is the umbilical wall this is the lateral surface and the junction portion this is known as umbilical shoulder the last umbilical wall where meets with the previous hole that portion is known as umbilical seam here you can see in this part this is the last umbilical wall and this is the previous hole so this junction point is known as umbilical seam this part is the ventral part that is the farthest away portion or farthest portion of the hole from the axis of coiling and the junction point between the ventral side and the flanks or lateral side is known as ventrolateral margin so the ventrolateral margin may be angular or ventrolateral margin may be not so sharp like this one the ventrolateral margin may be rounded also in this case the ventrolateral is margin is not so sharp it is broadly rounded so whenever we get this kinds of ventrolateral margin that is the junction point or junction portion between the ventral side and the flanks we call it that the ventrolateral margin is rounded the height of the last hole that is measuring from the uh, umbilical seam to ventral margin that is known as the hole height or often it is known as aperture height we abbreviated is as a h similarly the width of the last hole the maximum width of the last hole is known as hole width or often it is known as aperture width now these are very important parameters which we have to measure uh, in cephaloport cells whenever we have to describe any cephaloport cells because these are varies from uh, species to species genus to genus and families to families also uh, for each hole as i already told you for each hole the distant part from the axis of coiling is known as venter whereas the uh, closer closest part or nearest part uh, to the axis of coiling is the dorsal part or dorsum so for this hole this is the ventral part and this is the dorsal part when it comes to this portion this is the ventral part this should be the dorsal part now coming to the degree of involution of cephalopod cells now depending on the degree of involution that is how much the last hole cephalopod cells are grouped into two groups the one group is known as evolute and the other group is known as involute now the involute group is measured or grouped with the help of certain measurable parameters that is umbilical diameter by diameter that is this mass portion this is the umbilical diameter divided by the total diameter and it is symbolized as u that is the umbilical diameter and d that is the diameter so when this ratio that is the ratio between umbilical diameter and diameter is less than 0 0.3 then 
we call those cells as involute that means at this ratio there is very uh, fewer portion of the earlier holes are exposed are observed from this lateral view as you can see in this portion here the umbilicus portion is entirely closed here only a narrow uh, pit like umbilicus is observed in this case also a very little portion of the umbilicus portion is observed so these cells these three might be the involute cells whereas when the umbilical diameter by, di by diameter ratio is greater than one then we call them as evolute that means the loosely coiled shell where the maximum portion of the earlier holes is observed from this lateral view as you can see in this picture so in this case umbilical diameter is a handsome one and that is why this ratio is greater than one or very close to uh, one now coming to the shape of the cephalopod shells here the cephalopod shells is measured on the meters of the aperture that is the last hole and we measure the apertural height and apertural width and d day ratio of apertural width uh, by apertural height so when apertural width is greater than apertural height that is the ratio between apertural width is to apertural height is greater than one we call those cell as depressed and it looks like this so here you can see the width is greater than the height height is up to this level so in this case the shell is known as depressed whereas when the opposite is true that is apertural height is greater than apertural width that is the ratio between apertural width is to apertural height is less than one we call those cell as compressed so it looks like that here you can clearly see that the height apertural height is far greater than apertural width so these are known as compressed cell now here you can see the different uh, shape of cephalopods or different shape of ammonites in the first type you can see that here the holes are loosely coiled almost the holes are not in contact with each other that is a very loosely evolute form where the distinct holes are separated from each other this type of uh, ammonite shells is known as gyrocon here in this type you can see almost the apertural height and apertural width are almost equal and each hole just in contact with the previous hole this type of shell is known as tarficon and in the rest of figure you can see in this part the disco cone oxy cone and platycon here you can clearly see that these are of compressed form here you can here the apertural height is greater than apertural width now depending on the different shapes and different ratios these names are proposed in disco cone this is looks like a disc oxycone here you can see the angle ventral portion is very much angular whereas in platycone the ventral portion is narrow but rounded and in this right hand side the right hand column apart from the gyrocone the serpenticone spherocone cadicone and planorbicone in all these type the apertural width is greater than apertural height and how they exceed one with the other that is how apertural width how much is greater with respect to apertural height and what is the external shape of the uh, aperture or external shape of the hole depending on that different names are proposed now coming to the ornamentation that is the cell external cell sculpture of uh, cephalopods you can see that in most cases the cephalopod shell is ornamented with radial ornamentation you can see that all the elements all these ridges are radiating from the central portion are radiating from the central 
uh, axis, axis, axial, uh, axis of coiling part. That is why they are known as radial ornamentation. And in most of the cephalopod shells, they are dominating or it is most commonly found that they occur or they uh, consist of these kinds of radial ornamentation. Spiral ornamentation which is parallel to the spiral growth of cephalopod cell is uh, very insignificant or less common. Now why the radial ornamentation is more common in cephalopod cells? Because if you find a spiral ornamentation, if the suppose the entire cell of cephalopod is consist of spiral ornamentation, that is this type of ornamentation, which is parallel with the growth of the cephalopod cells. Now, if somehow any kind of breakage occur, that is if the cephalopod cell uh, suffered any kind of attack and some breakage occur in the apertural part, suppose this part is broken by some way, now this breakage will continue through the ridges and depressed portions of the spiral ornamentation and break the all the earlier holes that is the entire shell will be broken so to prevent this most of the cephalopods or uh, ammonites they have less commonly found consisting of the spiral ornamentation in most cases they are found consisting of the radial ornamentation here now if breakage occurs these radial elements these thicker coarse radial elements they prevent the accentuation of this breakage because this is the thicker part of the shell so that is why to resist or to prevent any kind of breakage occur in the aperture part and they prevent it to uh, continue to the earlier holes cephalopods or ammonites <coughs> develop these kinds of radial ornamentation more commonly than the spiral ornamentation there we found different types uh, and in this case for uh, different types of radial ornamentation uh, we consider a single hole that is starting from the dorsal portion to the ventral most portion so this line this is the dorsal most extremity of a hole and this is the ventral most extremity of a hole for each case this is the dorsal most extremity this is the ventral most extremity. for each case the lower portion is uh, the dorsal most extremity the dorsal margin and the upper portion is the ventral margin now in cephalopod cells we may found that the radial elements starting from the dorsal end and continue to the ventral margin and ends in the opposite side dorsal end so throughout the hole radially some elements are found continuous these are known as primary ribs or primary radial elements depending on the coarseness of the uh, radial elements so if this uh, radial elements are this much amount of coarse this much amount of thick we call them as ribs now apart from primary ribs, it is often found that some radial elements are not originating from the dorsal margin but rather they are originating somewhat in between the dorsal margin and ventral margin that is somewhere in uh, place in the flank maybe it is in the middle part or maybe in the lowermost ventral uh, lowermost flank or in the uppermost flank portion near the ventral ventral lateral margin and that will end at the same position in the opposite side also so these are not continuous up to the dorsal margin these kinds of ribs are known as solitary ribs, as you can see in this picture also it is uh, originating here that is not in the dorsal margin and in the opposite side also ends here these are known as solitary ribs here also this is these are solitary ribs apart from these two primary and solitary ribs or primary or solitary radial elements here 
you can see that the primary ribs originating at the dorsal margin and into the lateral portion when they came into the middle portion of the flank they are divided into two segments that is they are known as bifurcated these kinds of ornamentation is known as bifurcate or bifurcating radial elements or bifurcating radial ribs similarly they can instead of divided into two segments they can divided into three segments so in that case we known uh, we call them as trifurcation or uh, trifurcate and this bifurcation or trifurcation that is dividing of primary ribs can occur at any condition that may occur uh, in the lower part of the flank that may occur in the middle part of the flank that may occur uh, in the ventrolateral margin also so the position may be may vary uh, sometimes the primary ribs are found to be carved that is they are known as sinus or sometimes they are found the primary ribs forming these kinds of lens shaped pattern or these kinds of looped pattern so these are known as fibulate or looped radial elements now when the primary ribs divided into two segments that is either bifurcate or trifurcate then these smaller segmented part that is this part and this part these two individual parts are known as secondary radial elements or secondary uh, ribs in this case the primary ribs comes up to the middle part of the flank and then divided into two secondary ribs in this case the primary ribs originate at the dorsal margin come close to the middle portion of the flank and divided into three segments that is three secondary ribs so after dividing of the primary ribs the rest of the portion is known as secondary ribs similarly in the opposite side again these secondary ribs meet at the same position and again they will continue as primary ribs so the ribbing is looks like that only from this portion to the opposite side this portion here you can uh, see the bifurcation or trifurcation that is dividing of the primary ribs the lower most portion that is close to the dorsal most part dorsal part here you can see them as the primary ribs now the ribs or the radial elements they may be directed in different directions when the radial elements are inclined towards the growing direction that is towards the apertural direction the radial elements are known as prorsi radiate when the radial elements are inclined opposite to the apertural direction that is opposite to the growing direction it is known as when the radial elements are neutral that means they are neither inclined towards aperture nor inclined the opposite side of apertural direction then they are known as recti radiate so inclined towards growing direction inclined opposite growing direction and neither inclined in any direction now coming to some more ornamentation found in cephalopod shells the first one is known as spiral elements very fine spiral elements not very coarse which is found in some cephalopod shells and they occur throughout the shells these are actually very fine these are known as lidi uh, next is the node and tubercles these are circular to semi circular uh, elevated portions uh, found in the cephalopod cells here you can see the nodes and tubercles according depending on their relative size they are named differently and sometimes in the cephalopod cells some spine like sharp pointed thing are observed these are known as spines as you can see in this picture these are spines and some deep elevated portion like the nodes or tubercles often they are found they are elongated uh, in the radial directions 
so when they are elongated in the radial directions they are known as bully and when they are elongated spirally they are known as clavy here it is they are known as clavy apart from these often it is found that there is a continuous uh, ridge of spiral or continuous ridge occurs spirally uh, which is known as keel you know, this case. and mostly it is found in the ventral margin or near the ventral margin close to the ventral part and this is a spiral element it of it is a elevated part it consists throughout the shell and in contrast to the keel in some cephalopods in this ventral portion or close to this ventral portion we found some kinds of groove some kinds of depressed portion as you can see in this picture this is known as sulcus so when in the ventral portion these are elevated this is a ridge like pattern occur spirally this is known as keel when there is a depression there is a groove occur spirally near the ventral portion it is known as sulcus apart from this often it is found in the cephalopod shells that there are some depressed portions occur in some fixed intervals radially these are known as constrictions and these indicates growth pause here you can see the some of the pictures one is the node this is the circular depressed elevated part occur um, discontinuously these are nodes uh, tubercles relatively larger in size uh, basically these are thoughts the bases of the spines or the spine structure these are the spines the sharp pointed portion and the base basal part is basically this depressed large uh, discontinuous elevated portion um, bully is the little elongated uh, radially radially elongated elements and clavy is spirally elongated elements and this bully and clavy they may occur or you can say nodes tubercles or spines all these things they can occur in different positions of the cell they may occur in the umbilical margin at this part that is the umbilical shoulder part they may occur anywhere in the lateral surface anywhere in between this portion that is the lateral surface or anywhere in the flank they may occur in the ventrolateral margin that is the junction point or junction position between the ventral side and the lateral surface or they may occur in the ventral side also so anywhere within the shell they may occur now the most important part that is how we can differentiate the nautiloids and the ammonoids that is the two uh, subclass within the cephalopods and they can be distinguished with the help of some distinguishable characters the first is cell thickness in ammonites generally cell is thinner than nautiloids so obviously in nautiloids cell is uh, little thicker than ammonites the position of siphuncle that we observed in fossil specimen as the foramen or siphuncular opening is occur at the ventral side or close to the ventral side in case of ammonites whereas in nautilus or nautiloids the position of siphuncle what we found in the uh, fossil specimen as the siphuncular opening or foramen is found at the dorsal or middle part septum in ammonites are usually convex towards aperture as you can see here so this is the apertural direction so from apertural direction if you look at the septum it is convex from outside or convex from aperture in case of nautiloids the septum when looks from the aperture it looks concave septal neck that is the projecting part of siphuncle uh, when piercing the septum septal neck in ammonites is proquanitic that is directed towards aperture direction this way 
the septal neck whereas septal neck in nautilus they are directed opposite to the going direction this way so then it is known as retroquinity septal neck suture in nautiloids is the most simplest among the cephalopods that is mostly orthoceratitic and nautilitic where there is the suture found in the ammonoids they are the ceratitic goniatitic and ammonitic types so these are the properties these are the uh, parameters by which we can easily distinguish a nautiloid shell and a ammonoid uh, shell even they are preserved in the fossil record also so these parameters these uh, things these features they are also observed in fossil record so in fossil record also we can distinguish ammonoids from nautiloids so that's all for today's class thank you